Good morning. morning. Welcome. (laughs) You're welcome. (laughs) If you're new here among us, my name is Gene. I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. And I wonder, do you remember the story of the tortoise and the hare? Do you remember that story? We've been looking at all these old stories, usually from our childhood, and we notice like sometimes the details are fuzzy. We don't always get it quite right. And it doesn't help that there's a lot of versions of these stories or modern adaptations. But if we look at the tortoise and the hare, this is the basic premise for that story. You have a turtle and a rabbit. And so the rabbit is making fun of this turtle. You're so slow. How do you get anywhere? The turtle responds by challenging the rabbit to a race. Okay, strange already. So some versions of the story have a fox in it, and the fox is like this officiant. He's going to be at the starting line, right? Blow the whistle, whatever it is. And so you have the turtle and the rabbit. Go! Well, we knew what was going to happen. The rabbit leaves him in the dust. He's gone. But the rabbit says, hmm... I'm not done toying with this turtle. I got this. So he kind of becomes complacent, and he says, let me just take a nap by this tree here. Well, meanwhile, the turtle is just maintaining a pretty consistent and steady pace. Finally, passes by the rabbit quietly. Turtles are kind of quiet, right? Well, sure enough, the turtle makes it right near the finish line, and the rabbit wakes up. Whoa! Rabbit darts off to try to catch up, but it's too little, too late. The turtle wins the race. Today, we'll see that sometimes we start off really well, but then we don't finish so strong. We're going to look at complacency today and the rest of the story. Last time, we looked at Rehoboam and Jeroboam. So if you're new here, you don't know what's going on, I'll connect a few dots. You can always go back and watch the sermons to catch up. But you probably know who King David is. Maybe you know who King Solomon is. Well, Rehoboam is Solomon's son, so David's grandson. Jeroboam is the king of the north. We looked at a split kingdom. They have like a civil war, so to speak. There's a split kingdom now. Jeroboam is raised up against Rehoboam for the sin of his family and him. The kingdom is torn from Solomon. We saw that prophet came in there. So now we're going to continue here. Today, we'll be looking at Abijah and Asa. We're going to focus on the kings of the south, these descendants of David. So Rehoboam's son and Rehoboam's grandson as we go down the line. We're going to look at the theme of consistency and perseverance versus complacency. I made another chart. I'm going to hurt myself leaning over like that someday. (laughs) No, I did not draw that. Someone else did it for me. I told you before. If I drew it, he'd have bigger muscles. But it's a pretty realistic drawing, I think. But we see that there are books of the Bible that run in parallel. The Bible is not one book. It is a whole bunch of different books, a collection of different books. And some of them tell the same story with different details. And that's what we're seeing here. That's what makes it kind of confusing. This week, we're going to stay in 2 Chronicles a little more. Because as we can see, it gives us more details. But we're going to hop back and forth when we see little Not differences, nothing contradicts itself, but just different perspectives on certain things. So we see that there's war between Judah and Israel now after this split. So we'll just continue here, 2 Chronicles 13.1. Abijah began to rule over Judah in the 18th year of Jeroboam's reign in Israel. He reigned in Jerusalem three years. His mother was Maacah, the daughter of Uriel from Gibeah. Then war broke out between Abijah and Jeroboam. Judah, led by King Abijah, fielded 400,000 select warriors. This is in the south. While Jeroboam mustered 800,000 select troops from Israel. When the army of Judah arrived in the hill country of Ephraim, Abijah stood on Mount Zemaraim and shouted to Jeroboam and all Israel, Listen to me. 
Don't you realize that the Lord, the God of Israel, made a lasting covenant with David, giving him and his descendants the throne of Israel forever? So now Abijah will continue to taunt him. He's going to remind Jeroboam that he's not legit. That's like the basic premise here for this entire argument. He's going to remind him about the gold calves he made, the doubling down of the sin of Aaron in Exodus 32. He's twice as bad. He doesn't have legitimate worship there. In fact, anybody... Anybody in the north in Israel can become a priest these days. All they need to do is sacrifice a bull and seven goats. They're all set. They can buy the priesthood. But here, we have the Levites. That's the legit line. So it's all about lineage. He reminds him, I'm from the royal line. How can you come against me? He continues. He says, the Lord fights for us. Because all this, the Lord's not with you. He's with us. So he's got his full trust. Remember, he's got double the people against him. He's up there on this mountain with the confidence of the Lord. We're doing the right thing. It's not going to be good for you. So here's what it says. Meanwhile, Jeroboam had secretly sent part of his army around behind the men of Judah to ambush them. So he's giving this speech. And while he's doing that, they're trying to ambush them. When Judah realized, that's the people with Abijah, realized that they're being attacked from the front and the rear, they cried out to the Lord for help. Then the priests blew the trumpets, and the men of Judah began to shout. At the sound of their battle cry, God defeated Jeroboam and all Israel and routed them before Abijah and the army of Judah. The Israelite army fled from Judah, and God handed them over to Judah in defeat. Abijah and his army inflicted heavy losses on them. 500,000 of Israel's select troops were killed that day. Judah defeated Israel on that occasion because, because they trusted in the Lord, the God of their ancestors. So Abijah's army chases them down. And then it says that Jeroboam will die at a later time. The Lord strikes him down, it says. Now, it seems like Abijah is doing really well here, putting all his trust in the Lord. But if we hop back to 1 Kings, we're going to see something a little different. 1 Kings 15.3, I added Abijah because it says he committed the same sins as his father before him, and he was not faithful to the Lord his God as his ancestor David had been. But for David's sake, the Lord his God allowed his descendants to continue ruling, shining like a lamp, and he gave Abijah a son to rule over him in Jerusalem. So if we stay in 1 Kings 15 here, it's a little shorter. We see that Abijah dies. We get a summary of his reign. It's usually called like an evaluation of the reign. This will repeat itself over and over and over again. Then we get an evaluation and summary of Asa's reign, his son. Then two kings of Israel, and this is interesting, Nadab and Baasha. We're going to look a little bit more at Baasha later. So just hang on to that. So if we hop back over to 2 Chronicles, we get more information regarding Asa. So that was that middle section on the chart there. So let's take a look. When Abijah died, he was buried in the city of David. Then his son Asa became the next king. There was peace in the land for 10 years. Asa did what was pleasing and good in the sight of the Lord, his God. So here we see that there's a period of peace there because Asa is making all these religious reforms, getting rid of all the pagan worship stuff, instituting the good godly stuff, telling him you got to follow the law, etc., etc. He even has this really huge worship service. So we'll see that later too. He's going to continue this pattern. We see that he's a well-trained army, 300,000 men from Judah, and interestingly, 280,000 from Benjamin. So I told you before, it's not just the one tribe that's there. Sometimes it says just one tribe, but then we see Benjamin is associated with Judah, sometimes Simeon, because if you know the map, you know that their territory is located inside of Judah. So then we see a war between Asa and a Cushite named Zerah. This guy has one million men. Now, if I'm doing the math quickly in my head here, I think Judah has 580,000 men. So it's almost double the amount of men. Again, this happens. So here's what 
goes on. 2 Chronicles 14, 11. Then Asa cried out to the Lord his God, O Lord, no one but you can help the powerless against the mighty. Help us, O Lord, our God, for we trust in you alone. It is in your name that we have come against this vast horde. O Lord, you are our God. Do not let mere men prevail against you. So the Lord defeated the Cushites in the presence of Asa and the army of Judah, and the enemy fled. Again, they destroy, chase them down, plunder some towns, and then return to Jerusalem. If we turn the page, enter Azariah the prophet. 2 Chronicles 15.1, Then the Spirit of God came upon Azariah, son of Oded, and he went out to meet King Asa as he was returning from the battle. Listen to me, Asa, he shouted. Listen, all you people of Judah and Benjamin. The Lord will stay with you as long as you stay with him. Whenever you seek him, you will find him. But if you abandon him, he will abandon you. So now Asa, he hears this message. And again, he continues with these religious reforms. He has a lot of zeal here. Massive, as I said, worship service to renew the covenant. 700 cattle and 7,000 sheep. That's a lot of animal sacrifice. PETA went nuts. <laughs> Very upset. He even deposes his grandmother, Meika. Uh, this is the king mother at the time. She had made an obscene Asherah Ashra pole. This is phallic worship. He's going to cut it up and burn it. So he spares no one, even his grandma. He's like, Grandma, you're wrong. Okay, so we're getting rid of this stuff. So if you turn the page, 2 Chronicles 16, 1, in the 36th year of Asa's reign, King Baasha of Israel, so that's the north now, invades Judah and fortified Ramah in order to prevent anyone from entering or leaving King Asa's territory in Judah. Asa responded, by removing the silver and gold from the treasuries of the temple of the Lord in the royal palace, he sent it to King Ben-Hadad, different guy, of Aram, who was ruling in Damascus, along with this message. Let there be a treaty between you and me like the one between your father and my father. See, I am sending you silver and gold. Break your treaty with King Baasha of Israel so that he will leave me alone. So there's King Baasha, as I mentioned earlier. So now... Asa in the south does something a little different this time, if you noticed. He trusts in himself and his wealth and another man instead of the Lord. Bad move. But Ben-Hadad is used to chase away Baasha. It kind of seems like it works. Uses materials to fortify the town. So like, from our way of thinking, yeah, good move. Not so much. Ben-Hadad's line will give them a lot of trouble in the future. It was a bad move. Second Chronicles 16, 7. At that time, Hanani the seer came to King Asa, like a prophet, and told him, because you have put your trust in the king of Aram, instead of in the Lord your God, you missed your chance to destroy the army of the king of Aram. Don't you remember what happened to the Cushites and the Libyans and their vast army with all their chariots and charioteers? At that time, you relied on the Lord, and he handed them over to you. The eyes of the Lord searched the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. What a fool you've been. From now on, you'll be at war. Asa became so angry with Hanani for saying this that he threw him in prison and put him in the stocks. At that time, Asa also began to oppress some of his people. And if we keep reading, we're going to notice a pattern of behavior for Asa. 2 Chronicles 16, 11. The rest of the events in Asa's reign from beginning to end are recorded in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. In the 39th year of his reign, Asa developed a serious foot disease. Yet even with the severity of this disease, he did not seek the Lord's help, but turned only to his physicians. So he died in the 41st year of his reign. He was buried in the tomb he had carved out for himself in the city of David. He was laid on a bed perfumed with sweet spices and fragrant ointments, and the people built a huge funeral fire in his honor. Asa says, I got it. Abijah and Asa do similar things. They start off really well. And then they blow it. They don't finish strong. They got complacent and took their eyes off of the Lord. They did not finish strong. They both made the same mistakes 
that their enemies did, who probably thought, I got it, double the men. What could go wrong? Jeroboam, double the men. But it didn't matter. The Lord was not with him. Same with the Cushites against Asa. One million men, almost double the men. They probably thought, I got this. The Lord was not with them. See what's going on here? Abijah and Asa don't learn from that. Like the rabbit. They start off really well. But they become complacent. And they don't finish very strong. They become self-reliant and arrogant. I got it. Through these stories, we learn the dangers of this type of arrogance and complacency. That's the feeling, a smug feeling, of self-satisfaction over one's own achievements. I got this. Jesus also warns about complacency. A couple weeks ago, we looked at Matthew 23, the woes, hypocrites, he calls the religious teachers. If we turn the page, we see Matthew 24. Be alert is the main theme. Be ready when the Lord comes back again. Being alert to all these things. You're going to know the signs. There are going to be tribulations. You're going to see false teachers. And it's confusing. A lot of people don't understand this. This in Mark 13 because it's kind of like an A, B, A, B thing. Near future, far future. Near future, far future. The abomination of desolation in the temple. Desecrating the temple. It's destroyed in 70 AD. Jesus predicts that. But then he goes to far future times. And the point that should not be missed is be ready. Do not be complacent. So he starts to give parables, one about a servant. He gets drunk. He's not ready. The Lord comes back unexpectedly and throws him out in outer darkness where there'll be weeping, gnashing of teeth. And here's what happens. Sometimes the chapters aren't helpful. Good for reference, but they make us stop sometimes. But you interrupted Jesus because he's still talking. It all goes together. The parables are about the same type of things. Being ready. The oil and lamps. Be ready. You have ten virgins or bridesmaids. They're going to the bridegroom's house for the wedding feast. Five of them are foolish. Five are wise. They bring plenty of oil, the wise ones. They get there. The bridegroom's not there yet. They fall asleep. Bridegroom shows up around midnight. Hey, he's coming. They turn on the lamps. The foolish ones run out of oil. They ask the smart ones, can we have oil? Nope. There's not enough to go around, go to the store and get some. Well, the bridegroom arrives in the meantime. They go to the wedding feast. He locks the door. The foolish virgins or bride, bridesmaids come home, you know, are there waiting or come to the house. Let us in. Get away from me. Never knew you. Then he continues, Jesus is still talking. Three servants, the master, goes away on a long trip. Before he does, he gives talents. This is silver. A talent is about 75 pounds of silver. Gives them talents or silver according to their abilities to one, five talents, or five bags of silver, a lot, 75 pounds of silver. It's a lot of silver. To the other, two, and then to one, one. Well, a longer parable short. One with five, smart, doubles his investments. Two, smart, doubles his investments. One, decides to bury it in the ground. Does nothing with it. The master comes back. Well done, good and faithful slaves, he says to the first two. I'm going to give you more. To those who are faithful with little, you'll be given more. And the other one's like, I was scared of you because you're a hard master. So I buried it in the ground. He's like, you worthless and faithless slave. What's wrong with you? You could have put it in the bank, and at least I would have gotten some interest. He throws him out in the outer darkness where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus keeps talking. So a little note here. The parable of the talents is no more about, like, making money than the parable of the bridesmaids is about, like, saving oil. Just saying. So whenever anyone does that out of context, remind them, stop interrupting Jesus, please. Too many pastors do that. So we'll keep going. Ah, so 
when the Son of Man comes, ah, be alert, right? What was all the other stuff about in 24? He's going to wrap it up here for you. When the Son of Man comes, the end, be ready, be ready. Because it's going to be like when a shepherd separates out the sheep from the goats. He's going to put the sheep on his right hand, goats on his left. To the sheep, he says, ah, come get your inheritance in the kingdom. Because when you saw me thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When you saw me hungry, you gave me something to eat. When you saw me sick, you took care of me. When I was in prison, you visited me. When I was homeless, you gave me a place to stay. And the sheep respond, Lord, when did we ever see you? They repeat the things, all those different things. That which you did to the least of these, you did it to me. And then the goats, he repeats the cycle, but in the negative. You didn't do any of those things. So now, into the eternal punishment. Be ready. That's the point. We are not to be complacent. Like Hannah and I said to King Asa, the eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. And Jesus' warnings are dire on this subject. Be alert. Be ready for his coming. He's coming back. Also, only the Father knows. That's what he says in Matthew 24. And this is a funny one. I just want to take a minute to really teach you guys something that a lot of Christians have forgotten. We fall for a lot of false prophets. That's one of the warnings that Jesus gives in Matthew 24. Look out for the false prophets. They're going to say, here's the Messiah, or I'm the Messiah. I know everything. Jesus says he doesn't even know when this is going to happen. Only the Father knows. He repeats this in Acts 2. It says false prophecy. It's crazy. And people following after them or trying to figure it out, it's an act of disobedience. It's a lack of faith. Because Jesus says, only the Father knows. That's it. You know better than Jesus? Seriously. And here's why. Like the parable of the talents, another thing people get very, very wrong. They miss the point. If we knew, we could game the system. If we knew, we could game the system. The point is in not knowing faith and obedience. We must be in a constant state of readiness. That's the point of not knowing. When we go try to figure it out, or some false prophet tells us when it's going to happen, no, wrong. State of readiness, always. State of faith, always. He could come back now or now or now. So think about that. That's what Jesus is saying. Think about that when you treat other people a certain way. He might come back now, right after you've cursed someone. Now, right after you've been mean to someone, whatever it is. Goat. Goat, be careful. That's the point of these teachings. That's why he ends up there. Be ready all of the time. Love implicitly. Love always. Get your stuff together. Now, be ready. Don't game the system. That's the point. Jesus is coming back. We must be ready for his return at all times. Not this attitude that some people where, oh, you know, while I'm young, I'll just do whatever I want. <laughs> That's cool. I'll worry about that whole Jesus thing later. A lot of people do that. Jesus is giving some extremely serious warnings. Be alert. Watch out. Don't game the system. Careful with that. We should know this. Yet some have become complacent. They're thinking, I got it. Really? Okay. Especially now. As a little side note, it's been interesting through what we've been going through over the last couple of years. There are a lot of people who just stopped coming to church. They just stopped. They're watching online at home. That's it. They become complacent. 
Now, I want to acknowledge a few things before I rebuke a few things. <laughs> I get it. Some of you have been out of a routine if you're watching at home, and I get that. But you got to get back in the routine. You got to come in here. I want to acknowledge another thing. It's a very real thing. I've been hearing about it, so I want to acknowledge it. Some have become anxious. You get out of a routine, you're not used to being around a whole bunch of people anymore, whatever the case may be, and you get a little anxious about it, some social anxiety. Like, I just want to encourage you, I'm praying for you, because that's not a good kind of fear. We talked about that. There's kind of like a good fear, fear of the Lord, but that's a bad one. That's the enemy keeping you from being with your church family. So look, just I'll encourage you, just take that step. You'll see a lot of friendly people here, and if you're watching online, it's a good group. So I want to acknowledge that. There's some who are sick. Some are sick and they just can't come. I get it, so we're going to keep the streaming. But it's been a real tug of war. We didn't always have streaming. We didn't have it before this whole thing happened. Because my thought was, no, I'm not going to give someone an excuse to just, like, stay in bed, right? But we're going to keep it. But if that's you, church is about being a part of the body of Christ, not being apart from it. It's very important. Yes, you can pray from home. That's something you can do from home. But remember the sheep and the goats. This requires you actually doing a little something. You're supposed to be serving and loving people. And for the most part, you can't serve from the couch. And we know that Jesus will not reward us for hiding our talents, so to speak. There are some who have become complacent, but Jesus warns about this. Be alert. Be ready. Some are saying, I got it. But I would ask, how's it working for you? You got it, but you can't leave the house, but you got it. How's it working for you? Christ is calling us out of complacency and into community. This is where he wants us, the body of Christ. This is church, ecclesia. That's what it is in the Greek underneath the word church. And some Greek people will say, oh, we have another word for church, but it's not in the Bible. It's a newer word. That doesn't mean church. It means assembly. It's not about bricks or a building. It's about a body. It's about the body of Christ. So the word church, it's tough. We think of buildings. So when you... Do your emoji on your phone, right? The church, it's a building. It's not like a crowd of people. <laughs> if you could emoji that, I don't know. But, you know, as Americans, as Westerners, we think church, building, church, steeple. Church, but it's not. The Greek way of thinking about this, the New Testament way of thinking about this, is when they thought church, they thought, ah, all these, the body of Christ, all these people coming together. They would think of people assembling. Paul likens it to a body. So all different parts of a body that need to operate together, we're not supposed to be cut off or severed from one another. And so that's really important. That's church. We are the body of Christ. That's you. And so we need you to operate, to serve. You all have talents that we're supposed to be using in the church. We have to finish the race strong. It can't be like the rabbit. It's a marathon, not a sprint. We have to stay consistently in it to win it, so to speak. But first, you have to get in the race. You got to get out of bed. You have to put your shoes on. You have to take the first steps. But also, I want to make a side note about something. As we make resolutions this year, as we make commitments to things, we have to do so with balance. I found this is kind of interesting. We have to remember to pace ourselves, because quite often we don't have realistic expectations. And from a pastoral standpoint, I've seen a lot of people do this. They set unrealistic expectations. They set the bar way too high. And if we're being honest, sometimes we do that so that we have an excuse to quit. People do that. I've seen it all the time. 
Ah, see, I told you so. I can't do that. So a little piece of advice. Don't do Pastor Gene's Bible reading plan. <laughs> it's going to be hard. Start slow. Start a little bit at a time, a half hour a day, something like that. You can do it with balance. We have to get in the race, stay in it one step at a time. So I want to encourage you guys this year, church-wise, really, cut out a sitcom or something. You've already seen that episode of Friends <laughs> or Gilmore Girls or whatever. Spend that half hour reading your Bible. You can read all the Philippians in about a half hour, even if you read it slowly. Colossians, that too. Read a little bit, half hour, listen to God. Stop listening to the world. Listen to the Word. Try that. If you're not coming to church, come back. We miss you. It's okay, but one step at a time, just fine. Get to church on Sundays. If you're here, and I hope you're here, if you're here, try Bible study. Well, some people sleep, so got to say that. Wake up! <laughs> What was your favorite part of the sermon? Yeah, that's the question I'm going to ask you. <clears throat> if you're here, try Bible study. Dig in a little deeper. It's always kind of just an expansion on the sermon. We talk about it. Bible study questions. They're going to tell you how to do all this during the announcements portion, how you can get plugged in. If you're already doing that, serve. We have plenty of things for you to do. You can serve in the cafe. You're going to be told about that. It's awesome. We need help everywhere. You can clean. <laughs> you can greet people. Whatever you're good at, it doesn't matter. Serve. There's plenty of stuff to be done around here. You can do it the old-fashioned way. You can come up to me and actually like, talk to me. But we have an app if you don't want to talk to me. <laughs> you can use the app. You can write a little note there on the cards outside the doors. Connect with us. All right? Just take a next step and get that right. One step at a time. If you do too many steps, you're going to trip and fall. you got to crawl first. Then you can walk. And once you learn how to walk, you can run. Then you can run the race. One step at a time. If we look at 1 Thessalonians, the church in Thessaloniki, Thessalonica, Greek, Thessaloniki, Thessalonians, we see a church. Now, if you're looking for excuses to quit, they got plenty of them. <laughs> They're being persecuted. We see in Acts 17, they're one of the first churches to suffer persecution. Paul gets chased out of there by their own people, by Jewish people, suffering a lot. And Paul's just trying to give them a lot of encouragement. Some are suffering so bad they're dying. And so Paul's going to get to that. He's going to talk about, look, look, things are bad, but just, just focus on Jesus returning. That's it. Just focus on Jesus. It's okay. We don't have to grieve like those who don't have any hope. But in this dialogue, this is what he says here. 1 Thessalonians 5.1. Now, concerning how and when all this will happen, dear brothers and sisters, we don't really need to write you. For you know quite well that the day of the Lord's return will come unexpectedly, like a thief in the night. When people are saying everything is peaceful and secure, then disaster will fall on them as suddenly as a pregnant woman's labor pains begin. And there will be no escape. But you, who aren't in the dark about these things, dear brothers and sisters, and you won't be surprised when the day of the Lord comes like a thief, for you are all children of the light and of the day. We don't belong to darkness and night, so be on your guard, not asleep like the others. Stay alert and be clear-headed. Night is the time when people sleep and drinkers get drunk, but let us who live in the light be clear-headed, protected by the armor of faith and love, wearing as our helmet the confidence of our salvation. Sounds like Ephesians 6. We have to stay awake. We have to be alert. Sounds kind of like Jesus, right? Just echoing the teachings. Be alert. Stay awake. No distractions. We need to keep our eyes on Jesus. Run the race, the marathon. Not like a sprint and then quit. Steady, consistent pace with no complacency. We need to keep our eyes on Him. 
Hebrews 12.1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people. Then you won't become weary and give up. Focus on Jesus. As we resolve this year to improve, let's not just start strong. Let's finish strong so that we too, like Paul, can say this. 2 Timothy 4, 5. As for me, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. The time of my death is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race, and I have remained faithful. And now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, not just for Paul, but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. Amen. Let me pray for you. Lord, I thank you for the church that is your body, that is all your holy saints here today who came in to worship you, to give you glory, to give you praise. We love you, Lord. We vow this year to be more faithful, to be more joyous, more filled with the fruit of your Spirit as we lovingly and joyfully await your return. We thank you. Lord, bless these people. Bless this church. Mold us into your image, into wonderful vehicles for your love so that we can deliver your gospel In Jesus' name, amen.